Can you can you hear me okay? Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, cool. So uh, as Thomas said, my name is Irene, and uh, I work at a company called Boku. Some of you may have seen the rooster. I'm here spreading stickers all around the world. It's kind of a goal of ours to get Bob everywhere. But uh, we are uh, an open web technology company. So we're a consultancy, and we do training, and we run conferences and community events, and all really focused on open source and making open source uh, a viable technology for all, all the companies, right? We want everyone to run an open stack. So uh, that's kind of where I come from. And uh, a little bit more personally, I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer since I've been nine. Uh, I program in parking lots and all the things. And uh, if you're at all interested in data visualization, I have to do a little plug. Uh, we're running a conference in the States called OpenVizConf uh, that has to do with, o with data visualization on the web. So if you're interested, uh, we have a call for speakers. Please submit a talk or uh, you know, join us. It's going to be really, really great. But today, I really want to talk about data and what you do with your data in your web application, right? So if you think about what we do right now, we write CRUD apps, right? We write applications that let us create data, let us read data, update it, delete it, write every interface. Think about your email client, right? You write emails, you create them, you delete them, and so on and so forth. And that's great. That's very powerful. That's what most of our interfaces do, and that's what our users expect as a base level. But there's a few other things that we can start doing, right? Because we're now collecting more and more data from our users, right? Our users themselves are submitting data. And then we also have all the data of all our users in aggregate, which becomes really interesting because we can do two things. We can start computing various information based on that data, right? So like your Google Analytics is giving you various data about the transactions people take on your website. Or we can start filtering data for our users, right? So anything from searching through your data um, to, to finding and, and surfacing interesting parts of it. And the reason I think that's important is because the intersection of those things is where we really can make awesome applications happen, right? Not only do we give you the interfaces to create and, and view your data, but we also start giving you these extra layers on top to try and make sense of whatever it is your data might contain. Uh, and I'm here to talk specifically about why we can now do this more and more on the client, right? So traditionally, we take the server and we process data on that server and then we pipe that back to the client. And that's great, except it adds a lot of loads to our server, right? If you think about the fact that every user might have their own custom view of the data, that's a lot of number crunching you have to do. And sometimes it's not very intensive. Sometimes you just have a few thousand records you have to compute something from. But if you have 100,000 users, that's a lot of work on your server to do, let's say, once a second. Maybe you don't really have to do that. Maybe it's not necessarily collaborative or synchronized between all your users. And so doing these computations on the client side allows you to free up resources on the server and allows you to, to just you know, do less caching and less storage because you don't have to start doing per user uh, caching computation on the server. And the main reason to do this is because our browsers can handle it. It's great. W our browsers are incredibly powerful these days. Uh, and we can do anything from use web workers to crunch a bunch of data and not block the UI to you know, do really small calculations the entire time a user is interacting with the site. So, Yay client side browser, yay client side data. Um, let's, let's think about how we can do this in the browser. And so before I even get to talking about uh, data, I just want us to define what data means for the purpose of this talk, right? Because data is anything from a single value, like number 12, to arrays of values, uh, to this idea of a record or a model or a row or object, whatever you want to call it, right? Every system has their own name, but really it's a collection of properties with some values represented in whatever way you want. Um, and then we get to these collections of lists, right? So we'll have uh, arrays of records or models and whatnot. And this is kind of the unit we're going to be talking about. So I'm not going to talk so much about where it comes from or how to aggregate it. Really, I'm going to say, OK, let's assume that you can get your data into this JSON format or uh, some sort of a format that is uh, readable by um, others. I, I hope this isn't too bad a contrast. I hope you guys can see. But it's an array of objects, uh, JavaScript objects. Um, and so there's two ways to treat this data, right? So one is as rows of records. So what I just showed you really was an array of a bunch of JavaScript objects, right? Which is great when you want to do something with every record. Let's say you're just showing a list of items and you just want to iterate over every single one and you want to grab a property and then make a list item. That's great. That's awesome. 
But it's not so good if you're trying to figure out something about a specific property, right? Let's say you have 100 users and you want to figure out their average age. Well, first you have to go and iterate over every single record and grab the age, and then you have to do an average of that. So it's not so great if you just want to focus on single properties. So that's row-wise databases. Uh, and this is sort of what I was showing you, right? So every object um, is this uh, is a JSON object inside of a large array. For example, that's sort of how we do it in JavaScript. But you can think of it as you know, your standard MySQL tables and so on. Um, alternatively, what we can do is treat our data as column-wise data. So in this case, instead of storing Oh, that just looks like three empty boxes. I'm sorry, you guys. It's the worst. Um, what you don't actually see is there's lots of gray squares inside. Um, but the main idea is that instead of storing every single data as, as a single object, you are now storing all your properties inside of arrays. So if you think about um, that example, so those are the top names are all superheroes or supervillains. Uh, it's kind of a theme that we'll get to. Uh, and so that's basically your name column, right? And all that data is inside of a single array. And the only thing that actually makes a row is that all those things uh, is the actual index, right? So every item at index position zero is a row, quote unquote, right? But what I'm actually doing is storing all the data for a specific column in a single array. And this is really convenient if what I want to do is really quickly figure out the average age or something, because all I have is a bunch of numbers in a single array. So that's great. I don't have to iterate on to grab them. They're all already there. And it's a little dangerous because what it means is that our rows aren't actually individual entities. What it means is that they're only connected by the virtue of being positioned at a certain index. So if someone decides to just remove an item from your array, that will screw up your entire data, right? It's a terrible idea. But if you're doing a lot of column-wise computations, which is sometimes what you do when you do, for example, data visualization, that's kind of what I do, um, it's really important to be able to compute those numbers really fast. So column-wise data stores are really good for computing numbers uh, on, on entire columns. So, um, so if you, there's going to be lots of code, and hopefully you can see it better than uh, what we just saw. And if you want to follow along, uh, there's a repo on GitHub, uh, iraw slash client-side data. Um, there's lots of other examples there I actually won't cover. There's some things talking about anything from, uh, from JSON streaming to um, uh, web workers and so on. But uh, if I, I will point out the examples we are going to go through. So, but feel free to go and take a look. There's lots of instructions on how to um, take a look at the examples. So uh, what I wanted to do is to have kind of a theme. If we're going to talk about data, we might as well have really cool data. And so I went ahead and I found this website online that cataloged every single superhero and supervillain and collected amazing amounts of data about them because some people have a lot of time on the internet. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, this is great. We're going to look at superheroes. Who doesn't like those? Um, and so it's a little hard to see, but well, that's Batman. He's easy to see. But there's a couple of things I wanted to call out as features of this data, right? So the first thing we have is we have certain competencies like intelligence or strength or speed or durability or power or combat and how good that superhero or villain at those things. So those go from zero to one. So for example, Batman has intelligence of 1.0 because he's real smart uh, and that's pretty cool. Uh, he's not so fast, only 0.27. So uh, we'll just keep that in mind for later. We'll have some examples looking at that. Uh, we also have some, some body metrics, so height and weight, right, in centimeters and, and uh, pounds and feet and kilometers, all that good stuff. Um, not kilometers, kilograms, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> and things like eye color and hair color. Uh, and last but not least, towards the bottom, we have the superpower underscore properties. And so one cool thing is that someone identified about 180 different superpower abilities, and uh, those are just binary properties. If they're set to one, that means this particular superhero has them. So Batman has accuracy, which is pretty cool. He does not, however, have uh, aerokinesis, whatever that means. So anyways, keep those in mind. Uh, and that data is also available in that repo if you guys want to play with it and do cool things with, uh, with Batman. So uh, there's a, a three different uh, data sets, just the heroes, just the villains, or all that JSON. We're going to mostly look at all. Uh, I'm pretty sure. So we're going to start and look at some examples of dealing with rows of data. Um, that's kind of how the talk will split. We'll talk about row data, and then we'll talk about columnized data. So the first library I want to talk about uh, is actually probably one that hopefully all of you have used. 
uh, either underscore or low dash. How many people have used one of the two? All right, I see some hands. Cool, cool. All right. So all so this is um, this library is what people proclaim the standard library for JavaScript, right? It gives you lots and lots and lots of utilities for things you might want to do with arrays or objects or collections, however you want to call them. Um, that either give you that either modify that same array that you pass in, or it gives you some kind of a new array result, or uh, it actually just you know crunches everything down to a single value based on what it is you ask for. So it's very easy. You you have a collection of functions. You throw your data in, and out comes something else. So here are some examples, right? So for example, uh, in, at the top, um, can I even see any of this, Thomas? I hope you guys can. I'm sorry. Um, at the top, you have uh, basically an array. Uh, called data and it has two objects with properties a and b and all I want to do is add a new property to each one to each object called sum so I either iterate over the data array and um, I create I say row dot sum equals row a plus row b uh, and so all that's going to do is modify that original data object uh, data array to it in those two objects inside so very simple um, alternatively uh, if I want to get a brand new array for example I can use something a, a function called map uh, and all I say is, oh, for every value inside of this array, just return that value multiplied by 10. And so that's going to give me, instead of 1, 4, uh, 534, and 6, it's going to be 10, 40, 5,340, and 60. So again, very simple. Uh, and then the single value, really what I can do is calculate the minimum of an array, for example, uh, or I can do something called an inject that actually sums up an array for me, a little trick there. But there are lots and lots and lots of methods like this that really just simplify things for you so you don't have to you know, rewrite these really basic methods all the time. So uh, the first example we're going to look at is actually asking this question is wh of who is taller, superheroes or villains. It's pretty cool. So if you want to follow along, it's under the code slash underscore uh, visual.html example. Um, this is where I'm going to switch to uh, some code. So uh, we're going to look at, can you guys see this? Is this big enough? It's pretty good. All right, cool. So, so all I'm doing here is I'm actually getting just, I'm going to get the heroes and I'm going to get the villains. So these are just basic Ajax requests, nothing complicated there. Um, and then I'm using some deferreds here. You guys should really look up deferreds if you haven't used them. They make JavaScript not suck. Um, and then really all I'm doing here is first I'm iterating over all the heroes and all the villains. Uh, and then I go ahead and I check whether they have a height because some heroes and supervillains don't have heights assigned to them. Kind of a data problem, right? So data problems, pretty common situation. Um, and then all I do is I go ahead and I cast it into an, uh, uh, a number because they come in as a string. Um, and otherwise I, s I just say, oh, they don't actually have data. Um, and then all I really do is I find the heroes that have a height and I find the villains that have a height. Uh, and then I go ahead and I pluck out the actual height attribute. If remember, every single object was actually a collection of properties. All I want is just those numbers for each. Uh, and then I just go ahead and I compute the means, right? That's it, underscore dot mean. Um, and that's what I'll have to do. And the rest is actually uh, kind of visualizing this a little bit. And so um, turns out the villains are about 18 centimeters higher than, uh, than the heroes. Who would have thunk it? So anyways. Uh, that is some really basic underscore for you guys. So um, in terms of underscore versus low dash, so low, low dash, for those who haven't heard or of the library before, was really meant to be a drop-in replacement for underscore uh, because the person who wrote it was very focused uh, on performance and so on and so forth. So it is very performant. Um, but it does have slightly different behavior. So underscore kind of behaves in the way that the browser does. It passes whatever browser quirks you would run into right back to the user. Lodash tries to handle some of those, but it does mean it's not exactly drop-in replacement. And Lodash also has additional features that uh, underscore might not, um, like deep cloning or extending or so on and so forth. Um, and it, it claims to be faster, which is probably true if you're looking at a lot of data. Um, so anyways, uh, John Dalton, who wrote Lodash, now has commit rights to underscore, so we don't really know what's going to happen, but um, it's great to see both of these libraries kind of growing, um, and I highly recommend using them. So the next library I want to talk about is called TaffyDB, uh, which is a little bit more database-like. So underscore is very functional in nature, right? There was no concept 
of records or objects or models or anything. You really plop your data in and out comes something else. So it's really like a pipeline. You just put your data in and something else comes out. Um, TAF EDB is a little bit more database-like, uh, except records are JSON objects. So again, it's very uh, focused on being a browser-specific database. And it has a very rich selection language. So that's probably its biggest strength. You can uh, have very complex queries for your data. Um, uh, and it really allows you to, to sort of do some selection that would be a little bit hard otherwise. There's another library called JSON Select that kind of uses something that almost looks like CSS to select things from your data. Um, it, but uh, I want to talk about TaffyDB for now. Um, so it does support local storage. I know someone had asked before about that. And it, it's extensible in that it has sort of a, an actual hook to add methods of your own. Um, but it does, has no events, which I think is really important. If you're updating your data or you're adding rows or you're deleting rows, there's really no way to hook into your database and say, oh, let me know. Let me know if someone adds data. So a bit of a problem. And it has templating support because, as we've all seen, there's not enough templating engines out there. So um, anyways, it has its own templating, uh, of course. And so here's a really basic example of how you would use TaffyDB, right? So first, you would initialize a database by giving it an array of JSON objects, right? So all that heroes, JSON we just grabbed, we just plop it in here. Uh, and then let's say I just want to find all the male and all the female heroes. So what I would say is um, that heroes becomes a function that I can then pass query parameters to. And all I do is I take the properties that I want, and I say, here's the value I want that property to have. So for male heroes, I want the gender to be male and the type to be hero and the height to not be an A, right? So that's an example of kind of a pretty powerful selection, right, to do exclusion uh, and not just inclusion. And save for female heroes, I'd say gender, female, type hero, and so on and so forth. And then on the bottom is an interesting example where I want uh, some of the superheroes don't have a gender set or they don't have a gender defined. And so uh, this gives me uh, a way, for example, to say, oh, where the gender is not male and is not female, right? So there's different ways to really be chaining these, um, these selectors. Um, and so the next example I wanted to look at is how those abilities are related, right? I showed you the intelligence and combat and all that stuff. And what I'm really curious is, oh, if you are better at combat, are you faster? Or if you are more powerful, are you less intelligent, right? Super interesting question. So uh, the first thing we're going to go do is look at our code, uh, which again is super simple. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to fetch that data, and I'm going to create that database that we just looked at. And here, all I want to do is I want to grab all the hero objects that have all those competencies. right? I don't want ones that are undefined, because they're going to skew my data. So all I do is I say, oh, combat is undefined false, and power is undefined false, and so on and so forth. And that's it. That's really all I want to do. The rest is a lot of D3 magic. So uh, we're going to go ahead and look at some D3 magic. So here's all I have is a little scatter plot, which you can barely see, which is disappointing. Um, but what I have here is I can look at, um, at the type, so a hero or villain. I can look at gender, uh, male versus female. And then I can look at these properties. So for example, if I look at speed versus power, I don't know if you can see, but there's definitely a clear clustering kind of here early on. So what that means is, oh, uh, if I'm more powerful, I'm go the, the less powerful heroes are also slower, and the more powerful he heroes are faster, right? Uh, but then I can look at it, for example, in intelligence, and I can actually see they're pretty evenly distributed, right? So uh, all kind of along the middle. So just a little example of something you can do with, with just very easily querying your data. Um, so now that we've looked at a little bit of row-wise uh, stores, let's look at columns of data, right? So again, this is kind of where it gets pretty interesting in terms of aggregating some data. So the first library I want to talk about is called CrossFilter. Um, so CrossFilter was written by Michael Bostock, who also wrote D3. So there's some room to kind of work with the two together, which is pretty cool. And CrossFilter is a really great library in that it's very fast uh, because it uses typed arrays. So typed arrays are a great way to store data that is very predictable, uh, numeric data that is very predictable. We'll talk about that. Um, unfortunately, because it so heavily relies on typed arrays, it doesn't do so well with incomplete or messy data. Um, and so um, before we talk about typed arrays themselves, here's how you would actually use CrossFilter. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, call CrossFilter with my heroes array. 
Um, and the way you use cross filter is you create dimensions. So you say, oh, I want to break my data up by a certain, in a certain way, right? So in this case, I'm going to break them up by intelligence. So I say, here's cross filter dot dimension, and I give it a function by which it's going to actually break up all the data. So in this case, it's just the intelligence property. But th really, this could be just about anything, which makes it really neat. You can actually break your data up, not just by a single property, but actually by combining them in various ways. So it's kind of cool. Um, and then it lets me do some really basic things. So first I can say, okay, that dimension, I want to filter to get the lower quadrant, right? So I'm going to say, oh, you know, give me all the heroes whose intelligence is from 0 to, to 0 0.25, okay? Or uh, what I can do is then I want to get all the records from that specific filtration. So I say top, that top infinity. It's a little, a little tricky API there. And then I can clear my filtering. So again, um, it's a really good way to just find subsets in your data by creating these dimensions. And there's a limit on the number of dimensions you can make. I think it's 32 dimensions total, but I've never exceeded it, so it's not too bad. Um, now, I, want, I do want to talk about typed arrays because they by themselves are a really interesting um, thing that you could use. So um, typed arrays are just arrays where you say, oh, I'm going to store uh, a certain type of data in here. I'm going to store an unsigned 8-bit eight, uh, eight integer, right? So that says, oh, I can go from uh, 0 until um, 256, right, for example. Um, so some operations are a lot faster. So you are actually manipulating raw binary data, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, and by default, it initializes your array to 0. So that's very convenient for because you know by default JavaScript arrays have undefined values inside. So you don't have to then go back and pad your, your arrays with zeros or so on. Um, and the nice thing is you can share buffers. So first your data comes in and it's just in this, in this buffer, in this data buffer. And you say, oh, I want to look at this as 8-bit uh, unsigned integers or I want to look at it as 16-bit signed integers. doesn't matter. They're basically these windows on top of your, the same data. So... Uh, that's very convenient. And if you know the dimensions of your data, for example, if you know that all your values are going to fall between, you know, 0 and 255, that's great because uh, now you, you can reduce the memory footprint of your data by using a typed array. So, um, for example, uh, if we create a buffer up top there, it's going to say oh, a buffer of five items. Uh, then we're going to create, again, an unsigned 8-bit uh, integer array. Um, what that means is I can store values in it from 0 until 255. But it doesn't really handle very well values that don't fit within that specific criteria. So uh, if I, if I, um, uh, if I uh, put in a NAN into the array, it's going to convert it to a 0. If I put undefined, it's going to convert it to a 0. If I put a null, it's going to convert it to a 0. If I put the string cat, it's going to convert it to a 0. And if I put a number that's larger than the actual space that I have allocated, that 0 to 255, it's going to roll it around, right? So that last value, 2, is my, it's my leftover, if you will, right? So that's, again, not what I exactly put in there. So typed arrays, super cool, full of data surprises. So, so keep that in mind. So uh, let's look at a really quick example using cross filter. So uh, we just looked at these competencies. Um, and now I really kind of want to understand how they're distributed, right? Do we have a normal distribution? Uh, is everyone kind of on average intelligence? Or uh, do we have certain kind of peaks on either end, right? So this is the cross filter slash visual example, uh, if you want to follow along. Um, so, um, so this is uh, a slightly more complex example, just because we, uh, we could. So the first thing we're actually going to do is we're just going to identify our competencies. Uh, and we're going to filter out um, any, uh, any heroes that don't have these competencies for whatever reason. So again, we did this uh, in the previous example. And note, I'm still using underscore here because I really need my data to be complete before I put it into cross filter. So right, I have to make sure those numbers are there. None of them are empty because I can't have a zero, right? That's going to skew my result. So that's really important. Um, and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to create this cross filter right here, right? I'm just going to give all competent heroes, you know? Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and for every single one, I'm going to build a dimension, right? We just talked about, and I'm going to get all the records. Um, and then I'm going to calculate the minimum and the maximum. So conveniently, when you actually create a dimension, it sorts the data for you, right? Which is really great. So you can always get the top record or the bottom record, and it's definitely going to be the min or the max value. So that makes it easy. I don't have to now suddenly resort my data. So that's great. 
Uh, and then I'm just going to do a few extra computations that have to do with binning my data. So um, you guys can take a look at that example more. But here's what it looks like, right? So for example, uh, looking at my intelligence, uh, which goes from 0 0.06 to 1.12, we actually have someone who's incredibly intelligent here. Um, and this has got, oh, it looks like, you know, it's pretty normally distributed. Um, but then we start looking at some other capabilities like durability. It looks like we have a lot of really durable superheroes, which makes sense, you know, they have to be. Uh, and really not a lot, sort of in the average, lots of weak folks around here. So, um, and it just looks like most superheroes and villains are kind of uh, slow. So that's, that's kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit of information. So, um, so that is CrossFilter. Uh, super cool library, definitely um, give it a try. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about is uh, actually one that I'd worked on uh, as part of a project called the Miso Project. Uh, this year I worked with the Guardian newspaper a lot to try and help them uh, do data visualization faster. It turns out a lot of the bottleneck had to do with the data itself. Um, and so we created a library called Dataset um, that tries to answer various uh, challenges in manipulating your data. And it does a bunch of different things. Uh, it, it tries to deal with the entire life cycle of your data. So the first thing that you would normally do with your data is fetch it, right? You saw me using Ajax request or uh, whatever library probably has its own um, fetching mechanism. Uh, but the idea is here um, in data set is that you may want to fetch your data in different ways. You might have different importers, quote unquote, right? So you might have, uh, you might just need to make an Ajax request or you might need to actually pull for your data or maybe you're getting XML. We don't have XML support, but if you want to write it, you totally can, and I'll accept that pull request. Um, or uh, so on and so forth. So there's different ways in which you may have to fetch your data. And we built a system so that you can kind of say, OK, um, here, I wrote this custom way to do it, and we have some built-in ones that cover the basics, right? Uh, and once you've fetched your data, you actually have to parse your data into a certain format, right? So if you're bringing in XML, we need to convert it to a format that we understand uh, in, inside of data sets. So no matter where your data comes from, it then goes into a parser. And that parser takes and converts it into a form that represents the internals of the data in data set. So again, we also have these great parsers. So we have a standard JSON object parser. Doesn't really do very much. But we can also parse any sort of CSV data, for example. Or uh, if you actually happen to use Google Spreadsheets, which is a really convenient way to just throw data out there and then be able to get it back, um, we will parse the Google Spreadsheet format, which is actually a nightmare. So uh, we do that for you. And once you have all that data, there's lots of things you can do. You can compute various, um, various values out of it, your, your, your mins, your, your maxes, and so on and so forth. You can, you can filter it. You can create subsets of data. And actually, every time you filter that data, it becomes uh, something like a little data set. So basically, they're all connected. And you can, again, then query it and do all these other things. But it's tied back to your original data, which is pretty cool. Or you can actually derive completely new data sets, right? So if I want to group my data in some form, or um, you know, I want to modify it in some way, uh, I want to do a count by, um, we can do that too. So, um, so we, it works both in Node.js and on the client side. Uh, it's uh, version 0.4 right now. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it has built-in importers and parsers to sort of cover the basics. Uh, and it, they support most common data sources and structures. And where if people have weird data that they need help with, you know, we've been adding them as, as we need to. Uh, and they have this great uh, idea of an event of an ev evented view, right? So if I go into my heroes and I just create a view, I say, oh, give me all the heroes um, who are taller than 200 centimeters. Um, then it's going to give me a small subset of that. But that is still linked to the original data. And what I can do is say, oh, if anything changes in the original data, make sure this view is also in sync, right? So that's kind of cool because you can basically keep creating these views that are all tied back to the original. And so uh, you can only modify your data in the original view, uh, and that will propagate back down. So that's pretty cool. Um, and again, as I said, we cover some basic math functions uh, and some common derived functions, but we're um, always adding those as people are asking. So, um, so uh, here's how you might use data set, right? So again, very basic. Um, here I'm just saying, oh, I'm going to create a new heroes miso.data set, uh, and it's going to come from a URL. So that's how you do an Ajax uh, poll. Versus uh, if I wanted to have it locally, I can just say data and give it the array of objects, either way. Uh, and then I'm going to say, OK, heroes.fetch. And here I'm using the deferreds pattern. So hopefully some of you have seen this dot then. 
uh, because all fetch does is it go gets the data, but it returns me a deferred promise. So I can chain dot then onto it. Um, uh, and then I say, okay, once once I get my data back, I just wanna I just wanna console log um, the number of records, which you know in this case is 570. Um, and here's a, a slightly more complex example. So what I want to do maybe is count my heroes by their hair color, right? Super curious who, um, what is the most common hair color among superheroes? No idea. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to count by the hair underscore color property. Uh, and then I'm going to sort the data. So I'm going to say, oh, uh, sort by the count uh, column that's going to be added. Uh, and then let's say I just print a row somehow or whatever. So it looks like the top hair color is the first one is blank. Uh, and then black, brown, blonde, and eventually bald, which I did not know was a hair color. Um, but those are just uh, some basic examples. And so the last coding example we're going to look at um, is actually looking at all the superpowers. Remember I told you about those 170 different attributes. Um, so we just want to get a little bit of information about how those look like. So um, we're actually going to look, look at the example first. So. Um, I just kind of aggregated a bunch of statistics about um, what our superpowers look like. So there's actually 174 different types of superpowers. And on average, a hero has five. So, you know, pretty reasonable. And this is just a distribution. So, you know, 304 of them only have five and so on and so forth. Someone actually has 45 different superpowers. I really need to find out who. And then we have some top 10. And you can actually see the hero versus villain distribution. So. We definitely have more villains who have super strength than we have heroes, only 38%. Uh, and then super speed and durability and so on and so forth. My favorite one is actually looking at the bottom 10 superpowers because turns out wishing is a superpower, which means I have been a superhero all the time. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like anyone has it, but for some reason it's in the database. So uh, anything from wishing to orbing, which I don't really know what that means. Um, but again, just an example of a little fun thing that you can do pretty quickly with, uh, with your data. Uh, and so just, let's just look at the code really quickly. Um, so again, I'm just fetching all my heroes right here um, and uh, saying, okay, once that data is there, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to find all the properties, all the columns, right? So every property becomes a column uh, that are actually superpowers, right? So they're going to have the word superpower in their name. Um, and then uh, what I want to do is do something called add a computed column. So this has been a really highly requested feature where you have a column that's based on your other data. And every time you update your other data, this column updates automatically. So here I'm just saying, oh, I just want to add the number of superpowers that every e hero has, right? Because there's zero or one, that's super convenient. So I'm just going to say, oh, uh, let's add a column called SP count and it's a number. Um, and then just add up all the superpower columns. Um, and that's just going to create this sum column for me. Uh, and then I can do some basic things like compute the, the average of this column or the min and the max and so on. Um, and then really we're just kind of visualizing the rest here. So that's all, um, that's really all there's to it, right? Super short amount of code. And uh, there I learned that I was a superhero. So, um, so before uh, I conclude, I just wanted to have a few kind of closing remarks. Um, rows or columns, it, it really depends on your use case. You have to understand your data and the kind of things that you're going to be asking of your data, but know that there are databases that are more optimized for one or the other. Column-wise databases have been around for a really long time, so go definitely go and read up on them. Um, mixing and matching, you've probably seen that I use underscore in every single example. That's because it's just really good at doing certain things. So there's nothing wrong with actually mixing your libraries. Um, Beware of premature optimization. So there's lots of libraries that claim they're super fast, and that's really important if you're dealing with like 200,000 records. But most of the time, you really won't. Most of the time, you might have 1,000 rows, and then it really doesn't matter, right? So, uh, so know the dimensions of your data. Know that if it's pretty small, pick the more convenient library over the one that's going to be faster because it might just actually not matter. Um, if you're going to be accessing your data more than once, regardless of the library you're using, cache it, right? We've all made, uh, you know, object dictionaries and so on and so forth, and that's great. Um, and there's no reason not to, except that you have to be aware of overcaching because keys do end up taking space, and you don't want to just continuously allocate memory. So be conscious of it. Um, and if you're only using a subset of your data, filter it first, right? A lot of times I'll see people just constantly transforming all their data, but all they really care about is only a certain amount of it. That's really inefficient. 
Um, and don't forget to clean up your events, right? If you're, if you're bound to events and your, and your data changes, make sure you to clear those up. And last but not least, not everything can be client side. It's totally okay to say, hey, this is too much data. I'm still going to do this on the server. Most of the time, you still end up doing lots on the server, and then you have this really small subset you bring to the client, and that's where these libraries can come in. So I'm by no means advocating free at databases. Uh, we can all coexist peacefully. So that's all I have. If you have any questions for me, please do find me here or after. I absolutely love talking about data and data viz. Um, and I'd, I'd absolutely love to hear about where you might use this in your apps. So thank you. Arina, I'm just wondering, uh, what about the performance of uh, working with a large, large number of data sets like on the client side? Do you how do you feel like uh, when it runs in you know, a single thread? Do you feel, feel a reason there should be a way to uh, ha hand it over to a web worker or something like that? Or is it uh, okay to run on a single thread with the other uh, renderings? Um, I, I think that um, I don't have a great answer for how to deal with performance, except that you sort of have to know the characteristics of your data. And if the amount of data you're dealing with is unpredictable, then definitely keep it on the server if you can. You don't want to lock up the UI. So um, I, I try to keep um, the amount of data on the client as minimal as, as I need to, to be able to, um, to still do a lot, but not really uh, limit my user. So any other questions? M more questions? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, how does it work uh, with Backbone.js and other MVC? Oh, um, Backbone.js, yeah, absolutely. So, so collections and models in Backbone.js are kind of like a row-wise uh, database, right? Collections are really just a bunch of objects that are all effectively in an array internally. Um, so I, I think they very much fall in that category of row-wise databases where um, you're very good at iterating over things and so on. Um, but it becomes more difficult when you're actually trying to compute something because you're back to having to iterate over and grab those properties. And Backbone does that for you um, sometimes. So you don't necessarily see th that performance hit, but, but it's definitely there. So for certain applications, I will definitely only use uh, Backbone collections. If I'm rendering lists, and that's really all I have to do, maybe I have to sort them a little bit, um, then really it's not a problem. This, is real, this really comes in when I have numeric properties that I may want to compute things from. So. Oh, you owe me some hard questions, sir. <laughs> so um, I was sort of thinking about uh, a lot of the, the libraries that you're using have um, a fair bit of crossover in their functionality. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, let's say you, you've, you've given all these libraries to your developers. Um, you know, how do they decide which one to use to solve which problem if they've got all these things coming in which are almost doing the same thing? Wouldn't mm -hmm. it be nice if you could have like, just pull in a little piece from all of them? <laughs> maybe some components, maybe? <gasps> I see what you did there. Very yeah. clever. Uh, yes, it would, except internally, every single one of these libraries store the, stores the data very, very differently. And um, so anything from cross-filter using you know, uh, typed arrays to data set having a very specific internal format to these row-wise databases that really don't care. And if you start separating this functionality in different ways, you are going to have to start transforming those internal data formats into each other, which may introduce performance issues. But so that's only an issue if you have thousands <laughs> of records. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but no, you're right. There is, there is a lot of overlap. And so the first question is, what's best row or column wise? Um, and then I say, if your data is very predictable and you know exactly what it's going to do, and you don't need it to have any event bindings, go with cross filter. If event bindings are important uh, in any way, or you're importing data from crazy sources, I say go with data set, um, and that's that's the separation. So, but valid point. Tim, maybe you should have worn a T-shirt that says like "Build Component Base" okay. or something. <laughs> yeah, where's your component T-shirt? <laughs> uh, my, my friend's wearing one here. Oh, okay, good. All right. All right. Um, no, no. More questions? I think we have a bit more time. Food will be on. Three minutes. No more questions. Thank you, Irene, All very right. much. Thank you, guys.